Good morning, my name is Rob Phillips and I'm from Caltech. Today, I'm at Woods Hole in Massachusetts. Super privileged to be here. And I'm gonna be talking about great questions in the life sciences. And these are the questions where it's thought that maybe physics and computation will be able to shed some interesting light. Now, the question that I'm posing today is can we find a way to do what I would call decipher the modern Rosetta Stone? Here, just to give you kind of a sense, a historically inaccurate sense of the Rosetta Stone and its history, the basic story goes something like this. Napoleon had grand ambitions. He decided to go to Egypt. And when he got there, his soldiers, they ransacked the place. And one of the things that happened is that they found this, this rock, the Rosetta Stone. It led to a variety of geniuses, such as Thomas Young, known for his study of the interference of light, and Champollion to decipher the Rosetta Stone. Of course, from a historical, from an archeological perspective, this is clearly a very interesting thing. But I would say that at the moment, we're living through an era where there's, a much, there's much bigger fish to fry. There's a much more sort of demanding set of questions of deciphering something. And that's that we're living in the genomic era. So the question that I'm gonna to pose today has to do with, okay, we can now, more or less at will, sequence genomes. We can sequence genomes of human beings and a generic organism that we discover, bacteria, whatever. What this leads to is long strings of letters, A's, T's, G's, and C's, but it does leave us wondering, what does it all mean? Now, the, the, the thing I'm gonna to try to do in this talk is to give a sense of the extent to which we've successfully had a translation like that that I show you here, which is a, a, a sort of translation table for the Rosetta Stone, and the extent to which there are gaping holes in our understanding of this information content of genomes. So to go back to the 1960s, I want to tell you a little bit about what I think is one of the greatest experiments that was ever done in any science. And this was done by Matthias and Nirenberg. It has to do with cracking the genetic code. The idea is that after the elucidation of the structure of DNA by Watson and Crick, so 1953, there was a 10-year rush, 15-year rush, to figure out what does the sequence of letters, A, T, G, and C, signify? And the reason that this is, I would say, interesting in a certain puzzle is that we, we know that there are four nucleotides, A, T, G, and C, as I already mentioned, and we also know that a typical protein has on the order of 300 amino acids. Now, if it takes three nucleotides to code for each amino acid, then that means a typical sequence, nucleotide sequence, is around four to the 1,000th different possibilities. It's a huge combinatorial space. And the question they set themselves was, how do we tame that huge complexity and beat it down into a form where we would actually have some sort of translation table? The way this experiment happened was synthetic biology, if you like. It wasn't called that at the time, but what they did is they synthesized mRNAs that were repetitive, U, 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 and so on. And then they fed these mRNAs to a cell extract and asked the question, which of the radio-labeled amino acids are incorporated into the protein? And what they found is a chain, phenylalanine, 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 and so on. And the consequence was that they cracked the genetic code. By doing this repeatedly, they were able to essentially figure out the entire gen genetic code. So the way to think of this, most people have seen this before, you start from the inner circle, that tells you the first codon, the first letter. Then you go to the next circle out, that tells you the second one. The third circle out tells you the third. And if you look at that triplet, and then that will tell you on the fourth ring, which amino acid goes with that collection of nucleotides. The reason I say in the title that this is only a partial vocabulary is that it's in a certain sense deceptive. It makes it sound as though we've cracked this Rosetta Stone when in fact we really haven't. And the reason I say that is illustrated, I think, even in the case of the supposedly best understood organism, which is the bacterium E. coli. If you go look at the databases of what we know about E. coli, what you'll find is that 2,000 of the roughly 4,500 genes have no regulatory annotation. Now, what do I mean by that? What I mean is that we indeed know where genes start. We indeed know that certain amino acids will be produced and strung together as a result of that gene. But what we know nothing about 
is the decoration of the DNA in front of that gene that tells it whether it should be on or not in the first place. In other words, it's regulated. And we really don't know how that works. In the, in the case of eukaryotic cells, animal cells, the situation is even worse, as shown by the lower diagram here. What that is, is it's showing a, a hunk of genomic DNA, and this green part over here is known as an enhancer. Enhancer refers to a little chunk of DNA that can be as far away as megabases from the gene it controls, and then it bends over and kisses its regulatory region onto the, the basal transcription apparatus and turns the gene on. The problem is, is that if I handed you some genomic sequence and said, okay, you tell me where the enhancers are, and you tell me which genes they interact with, it would be very hard at best. Okay, so I claim that this means we really haven't cracked the full genetic code. And so what I, th this is to me really the great question of this particular talk. And I want to tell you a little bit about approaches that have been taken. This is from an experiment that was done by Justin Kinney in his uh, PhD thesis work, which I think is really quite uh, cool as a way looking forward to try and own the genome with single base pair resolution. So as shown in this diagram, I have some I have some promoter, some region of DNA that controls a gene that I'm interested in. I want to figure, and I don't know what the regulatory behavior is. I want to find that out. So how do we do that? His idea was, let's take the DNA and mutate it at about 10%. In other words, 10 out of every 100 bases will screw up. We'll change them from A to T and A to G and so on. And then we'll ask the question, if we wire up cells, each cell having a different version of this mutagenized promoter, how much fluorescence does the cell produce? The fluorescence is used as a way to read out how much we've messed up the gene. And so as shown in this diagram, he makes a library of what are called plasmids. These are small circular DNAs with his gene of interest, the mutagenized gene. The cells are fluorescent. Then what he does is sorts the cells according to how much fluorescence they have. That's what you see here, the sorting scheme. And then categorizes them according to how high or low their fluorescence is, and that's the point of this bottom diagram. The group called B1, B2, B3, and so on, those are bins in which the, the cells have different levels of fluorescence, and each collection has a different fluorescence. So that's the key idea. For me, where physics and, and sort of theory meets this kind of experiment is the, the graph shown here in the upper right, which tells us the relationship between sequence and which bin a given cell got sorted into. Let me try and give you an analogy. I'm in a room right now. There's a door. If someone were to walk in the door right now, I could make a guess about the height of that person. How might I do that? Well, I would just reason, well, typical human beings are between five and six feet tall. I would do something along those lines. If somebody told me the next person to walk in is going to be a woman, then I would do much better on localizing that person's height. Now, why is that? It's because there's a, what's called a mutual information between height and gender. Just like in this case, there's a mutual information between which base, as it a, as, is it an A, a T, a G, or a C at a given site, and which bin the cells will be sorted into. So what comes out of this is a, what's called an information footprint. The idea is it tells you which bases, these are the ones labeled in orange, which bases are the ones that are important for gene expression. And so what you can do with this method is you can take to, go to a region of the genome, which you're ignorant about, and then you can figure out where transcription factors will bind, and you can start to decode this next layer of information that's hidden in the genome. So let's think about this. What I've told you is that there's a challenge. First of all, we really don't understand the, the genome in detail at, the, at all levels of its information. But let's say that we solve the problem in the, using the type of scheme that I just talked about. Then what I would say is we have a translation table like this picture that I showed you earlier, which comes from Champollion, which was basically telling us the meaning of the symbols in the hieroglyphics. But what I want you to consider is that having the list of symbols, if I knew the letters in the English alphabet, and even perhaps if I knew the meaning of, if I had words in the English alphabet, that doesn't imply that I'm ready to write a novel. So the vision that I really want to finish with is, let's say that one solves this problem of figuring out what the genome says at the level of the words. How do we compose a genomic novel? That's the question that I want to think about. So in order to argue this, I want to go back in a way to engineering and the physics setting. I think of engineering as synthetic physics. And the reason I put the word synthetic in there is because I want to, I want to conjure up images of synthetic biology. So 
engineering is synthetic physics. And often what one does is the simple problem first, a toy problem. You don't work on the airplane wing first, you work on flow past a sphere or flow past a cylinder, and you work out the rules of that problem. And then once you have those rules in hand, then you turn to the more complicated situation. So the, the beauty of the picture I show you above is this is the kind of thing that Leonardo da Vinci was already thinking about. He was, he was curious about flow past a sphere. He was able to draw the vortices that you see in the picture. And my point is that after 150 years of fluid mechanics, we started to understand things well enough to be able to then say, let's try to use these principles for something more tricky, which is, for example, the shape of an airfoil. I love this picture, which shows, it's a Boeing picture, and it shows a 747 and a 787. Really gives you a sense of where we've come with, uh, with engineering. And the dream that I guess I would like to articulate for biology is to have an, a biological engineering that bears the same relationship to fundamental science that this kind of thing in mechanical and electrical engineering do to physics. So in a certain sense, what I would like is I'd like to be able to write the novel of the anglerfish. So the idea is I'd go grab a fish, sequence its genome, be able to put the sequence into a computer, to read it and say, OK, those are the genes. These are the regulatory regions. These over here are, in a certain sense, DNA fossils. And now I will reprogram this fish so that the color of the light that comes out of its little thing on its head is different. That's, that's a vision for synthetic biology that would really be based on the, the infrastructure in deciphering the genomic Rosetta Stone. In summary, what I've tried to say, I think, is a great question of our time, is the search to decipher these genomic Rosetta Stones. We've already learned a lot, but I think that, that in a certain sense, Thomas Paine once said, a long habit of thinking a thing wrong gives it a superficial appearance of being right. A long habit of thinking that we understand genomes and we've cracked the code gives it a superficial appearance of having been solved, but I think really it hasn't. And so to me, that's, uh, that's one of the great questions. So I close by just saying, um, you know, it's a subjective matter, this issue of what are great questions, but that's the privilege of doing science, is that we get to ask questions that interest us and we're able to go pursue them. Thanks for listening.